Good morning, good afternoon. Welcome everyone to day two of the October 2021 CentOS Dojo. We're really pleased that you've joined us here for another day. My name is Rich Bowen and I am your host today. So if you have any questions or concerns throughout the whole day, please uh, do ping me in the chat. Our first presentation of today is David Duncan, who will be presenting CentOS Stream and meeting the user requirements of public cloud. If you have any questions during the talk, please go ahead and put them in the Q&A tab and they will be addressed when uh, David wants to take questions. So thank you, David, go ahead. <laughs> and Neil's first, of course. So uh, <laughs> thanks everyone for coming and, and uh, um, uh, joining our this discussion. I, I'm super excited about this. Um, so just a little personal introduction. My name is David Duncan. Um, I am a partner solutions architect at Amazon Web Services. And um, I have a, a fair amount of experience here in the cloud world and, and uh, or the public cloud world and, and, um, and have worked with the operating system partners for many years um, and uh, lead a lot of our um, operating system partner strategy. Um, I also have the uh, pleasure of working with a lot of uh, a lot of people in the audience here uh, who are also uh, members of the um, uh, Fedora team and have been around uh, working on CentOS for a long time as well, um, having fun. And hobbies, love dog training and uh, I'm out on the radio there, uh, looking forward to connecting with all the rest of you uh, on the air. So uh, we're here today specifically to talk about uh, some of the things that I think, um, I think really um, we've had, you know, we've had some time to digest some of the immediate reactions around um, the announcements and the work that has been going on for a long time, right? So 2019, um, uh, the, the announcement or the work on CentOS Stream was really getting some big traction. And the, uh, the thing that uh, I think was on everyone's mind was what are we going to do, you know, with this Enterprise Linux next? But then once the announcements went out last year in uh, just in general, uh, around the the um, uh, CentOS stream replacing the standard CentOS projects, there was a lot of conversation um, and and reactions to what happened that led us all to kind of, to have to sort of reevaluate what we were trying to say, um, just generally to the rest of the world, and. If you have any experience with Amazon, um, you'll already be familiar with the term working backwards. Um, and uh, I know that's not, you know, exclusive to um, to Amazon just in terms of a practice, but it's one that I think is, is very seasoned here and has uh, a lot of protocol around it. Um, but that's not always what we do in open source projects. Sometimes we're faced with problems uh, we have to resolve right now. And you know we use the tools that we have, and the expertise that we have. We can you know we can bring to the project uh, to get, to get it done. Right? Um, but let's work backwards here a little bit today and look at this from the customer perspective because uh, we see a lot of people in the you know in the world of out, or out in the world using CentOS and. And those people who were using CentOS um, had were faced with you know some big questions, right? And um, there are customers there in the public cloud you know infrastructure that um, find san you know they they find sanity in their operations by moving from what they perceive as stable to what they have claimed is unstable and and they're they're a little bit you know scared of how how this might um this might this experience is going to affect them right so they see stable as what they have and they see unstable as what 
they would move to. Um, and really it might even, you know, as they move from their own premises to the cloud, it's really uh, probably the other way around, right? What they perceive to be unstable is probably more uh, what they're looking at in terms of what's stable versus uh, the concepts that they have on premises. So um, a long time ago, you know, a decision was made to make CentOS available in the cloud. And um, part of that was, you know, um, on my side, I have to say thanks to people like uh, KB Singh, who put a lot of time and effort into making sure that there were images out there for people to use. And there are a lot of users for, for, uh, for CentOS, you know, it is, um, it is a, a, a prized um, uh, operating system or platform uh, partner for, uh, for the, for the, you know, for the public cloud, because it gives a sense of stability and certainty of enterprise Linux to a lot of customers, a lot of users. And I don't have a lot of polish stories here. I really just put together a couple <clears throat> so that we could look at um, what happens in the minds of customers. And maybe I'll, I'll come across, you know, you'll come across a little bit more of a user story in some of the, some of the ways that I've described this. Um, but I wanted to kind of focus in on some of the things that I hear and some of the things that have been really, really frightening for, you know, in terms of what customers have heard um, and where they went with what they'd heard. And they don't necessarily come from directly from customers who use CentOS. They, the, you know, that the idea is that there is a there is a way to translate this experience. And having been around so many who have, you know, craved this experience or or, or have been mandated to move to public cloud as a as a model, um, but had a sense of what what they thought was completely stable on premises. Um, I'll try to sort of identify that and, you know, identify my sources just generally, but um, some of the detail comes from just working directly and it, uh, with these customers who face these issues all the time and hearing what they have to say. Okay, so um, I think every one of us has heard that there is something we want to rely on forever, right? There's some, IT um, admin, CTO, or, or uh, information systems director who says, we're going to deploy this in a way that is going to last for 30 years. Right? And um, right out of the gate, we all have a lot of problems with that. It's like, what, what on earth do you mean by validate, you know, validated configuration? What do you mean by we've certified that for our own for internal use? And a lot of times they just mean that they want to know exactly what's going to go wrong under exactly the, you know, the same circumstances. But the, the public cloud provides an architecture that, that, allows you to be very specific about what you, what it is that you're you're deploying and you can create these uh, machine images that are super simple and there are a lot of methodologies for handling this from from uh, 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 you know from from the experience uh, over you know more than more than a decade of this this uh, um, this journey already and one of the things that came to mind to me is that we, you know, this doesn't really take into account this idea of, of having a static image. And having a static image is a very strong and compelling argument for, you know, inside of the public cloud experience. You want to be able to be the master of exactly what it is that you need. And CentOS, so let's look at CentOS, right? A lot of customers are, are capable of doing this, but of course there's not really a, a strong way to create an update, a, a, a locked release structure, uh, just based on uh, the a simple configuration. You gotta get in there and make some modifications. The, the, but the, um, but customers will, 
continuously look to the community and ask, you know, or, or not the community, but they look back into the into the uh, enterprise, the you know, their cloud provider, and they say, how is it that you're delivering this stability in, you know, X release of, um, of uh, CentOS? And the answer generally comes back, um, you know, that, oh, okay, well, we've got all of these out of tree things. We have, you know, we provide our own RPMs. We have, you know, this or that. And that's not really, um, that's not really, in my opinion, a way to, to, to um, push the, the experience that those customers are looking for. They are really looking for something that's a lot more solid, that has a, a boundary and, uh, you know, usually um, creating those golden those golden images is the way is the way to go. And once we have a golden image, the customer can you know or user can can do a lot of things that they want to do. Why they would need to do that on a standard CentOS versus a CentOS stream image um, is the question. There's no good experience here for those older systems as they look to the hardware of the future, right? Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that solution or that, that discussion point um, in a later slide. Um, <clears throat> so if you're clear on the way that Red Hat operates, you'll know one of the things that makes it valuable, a valuable partner to the to original equipment manufacturers uh, and the public clouds who build their own hardware is that we have we can work together, right? The uh, from the um, from the standpoint of hardware or systems that haven't been released yet, there are there are ways of building NDA uh, discussions that allow us to um, focus together on the right approach without violating any of the requirements so of the um, of, you know the public companies themselves um, which is difficult to do on an individual basis right we can't go back and tell each customer who's using CentOS that we're going to make a big change um, we have to work with Red Hat and say Red Hat we have something that is going to go into um, you know, that is already maybe, you know, it's typically always up in the upstream kernel or in some upstream projects. And we say, hey, we, we, we are focused on keenly focused and keenly aware of patches that need to be uh, incorporated into the, um, the Red Hat kernel. So would you please take these changes? And then that circles back. Well, previously, we would have customers who, you know, there would be a big announcement that this new hardware, new technology was available. Let's take uh, the C5 uh, instance type was a great example of this where it was announced. We were, um, you know, we were still working on the on full support for the Nitro cards and the ENA in the very next point release of RHEL. The customers wanted to have it today, right? They, the users were excited to have this new hardware. Um, and the only way to deliver that was an out of tree driver, uh, a taint, right, of sorts. So um, that would not have been the case. So when th that happened, you know, years ago, and, and that would not have been the case with the CentOS stream uh, release. With a CentOS stream release, we could have pointed customers to a test, you know, to an opportunity to do um, uh, public testing, to review the CI that, you know, that was coming out, uh, to see sort of the pre, uh, the pre-release to what was, uh, you know, Red Hat Enterprise Linux. Now, if they were uh, looking at this from the perspective of the previous uh, user story, you know, from this from this perspective, they might not want to include those changes, right? Oh well, these these changes from CentOS Stream would uh, would would affect our our validated stack. But for a customer who is more interested in gaining access to the hardware, 
this is really the fastest and the most, you know, most successful way uh, for any of that support to be to be provided immediately. And all of the hardware support that goes on inside of a public cloud is something that should be supported in an OEM style, I think, never out of tree, right? And this is an opportunity for, uh, for and CentOS Stream is, in fact, an opportunity for those customers to really enjoy having exactly what it is that they were looking for in their CentOS experience long before um, and the and the only way that they could they could get that was to have some sort of an out of tree experience, or uh, to use a kernel mainline um, project to to get what they need. I, so you know, almost so. Let's say in television and you know in books, it, it's escapist literature. Every drama, there's like a certain peril that has to be overcome, right? And in these trying times, these past couple of, you know, this past year and, and this year we're in, um, there's been a lot of valid concerns, which found a voice and organized over the internet um, because public assembly wasn't practical. And... Um, there's been some opportunity to build a sound, sounding board for the overblown and the unfounded narrative. And <clears throat> um, I feel like uh, there's been a lot of opportunity for people to learn about this CentOS stream experience by reading the headlines, right? And I always, I really want to remind people that uh, CentOS 7 is with us until 2024, you know, at least. And the work that the team has done and the decisions that they have made are giving us 8.5, you know, well into next year uh, for customers who are not ready or users who are not ready to make the next, um, uh, the, you know, make that next uh, step, which is not a very large step. So obviously the headline's not, not even remotely accurate that I've got here on this slide, right? But it was, I'm sure, attractive as a statement. And uh, as a method to set the stage for the drama, they used it. So you have to read the content to get to the bottom of the real story. The details are there, you know, the concept that this is, this gives preview release instead of um, instead of doing some sort of a a, a complex support. You know, that's uh, that's um, that's something you know we know is uh, is is in there. Um, so the first question I deal with when I have customers uh, who are um, dealing with this uh, in a discussion base. Is that they've really seen this too? You know, this this article it's a little too long. Do they didn't read it? They saw the headline. Now here's their assessment. They want to know: Is CentOS dead? Do I have to go find something else? Am I going to run away from this? Um, what do we do now? Right. Uh, and you know, you discover there that they aren't in any, you know, that headline isn't really in any way reflected the CentOS community or the project initiatives, but it's enough to create doubt. And to a director who relies on a strategic certainty, doubt is risk. And no one responsible for that profit and loss is going to consider a move towards death perceived as, or, you know, if, if it's perceived, even if it's just perceived, not real. So I think it rings true today, um, this statement, <laughs> as true as it did uh, in 2009. And um, uh, for many years now, the CentOS initiative has been working, um, at, you know, in a group of, of uh, a select few who could provide a strong level of support and confidence that was long lasting. And I'm grateful to all of you 
Johnny, Fabian, you know, Carl, KB, um, for your chosen commitment and the large amount of time that you had, uh, you, you've provided to uh, collaborate and, and put this together and, and to make this work for so many of us out in the community. And I'm not saying that there wasn't constantly community uh, engagement, but for the most part, the day-to-day -day operations has been handled by a, a, a fairly small group of, of individuals. Well, that's changing. And this is the super exciting part. This is the part that I think is, is uh, this has been um, something that supports a much greater community than just uh, the CentOS initiative. And, and from the, you know, from the perspective of, of having many operating, operating systems to support and much, uh, much, you know, a large sense of choice, um, the, the special interest groups represent a huge amount of opportunity for us for it to have an influence along or around an ecosystem and to create, to generate an ecosystem um, that, uh, um, that really, uh, that really changes the game and provides a lot more of, of a, of a choose your own destiny um, within this context. And it gives, a a slate to um and this let me say it centos stream and the centos stream project gives the community at large including the public clouds who are looking at how they're going to to leverage uh the content in in different ways a slate for collaboration for creating testing and uh and um uh, new changes in virtualization and uh, new ways of, you know, and improved models for uh, for ensuring that the cloud images are made in the way that is consistent with their requirements and uh, opens the discussion to ask the questions of how can this be better upstream. And then on the other side, on the very flip side of this, uh, it provides a community effort that also can support commercial contributions in a way that is consistent with the guidelines and the model that Red Hat has uh, has um, outlined for many years as a commitment to enterprise the enterprise experience. So, I think that you know when a customer or when a user decides that they're going to use uh, sent to a stream in their configurations as a way of building out that practice on enterprise Linux. They know that they can always return to a space that is commercially supported through that um, uh, conversion to rel or uh, the use of their supported model. Right. Um, there's no, there's no, there's no transition there that uh, that that isn't easy easy to follow, and uh, public cloud is a different pro approach. Um, you know, the there is uh, it's not the on-premises world. Resources are more generally available. Um, there are processes and updates that are in the hands of every user in ways that aren't easily provided across, you know, systems on premises. Um, resources here you know, are used and discarded uh, as quickly as they are no longer required. And really the, the, fa the fundamental rule, the fundamental principle of the public cloud is that you know, agility is prized above all else and changing the safe shape of a service to match customer de demand complements that objective of agility. Um, and I'll address something about the, the messaging. Uh, I think that this was a difficult thing to message. I think that there was, there were a lot of complexities and um, we didn't, there wasn't a buildup of strict PR. It was handled in a community fashion from people who were 
um, who were uh, uh, allowed to create and make their own opinions about the process. But they were faced with questions that came, I think, directly from uh, a place of not having all of the facts. And this was one of those cases where we needed to have a lot of facts before we made um, some, you know, we made broad statements about how this was going to impact us as users. The community SIGs, I think that's really one of the more important parts of the community SIGs was that we're building the opportunity for the same kind of agility for cust you know, for uh, current users who have, uh, who do have, you know, complex issues like recompiling their own, their own uh, device drivers um, out of tree in ways that are, you know, the ways that can be, um, can be automated, right? Providing some of that bed for, for ensuring that they have a better practice they, the, and there are practices that they can follow. Um, that's a huge part of the SIGs. I and mean, that's one of the things that I think the KMOD SIG is all about. Super, super exciting to see that. And there's a lot of work that can be done upstream. So in the cloud system, uh, there are some really fundamental things that I think are really exciting. And I'm stealing a little bit of this from my, uh, from one of my um, uh, favorite reads, uh, which is the, uh, the Cloud Systems Administrator's Handbook. Uh, I think that's what it's called. That's so, uh, by uh, uh, Limoncelli and Strata Chalop. Um, and one of my favorite terms that they use is fail-only architecture. And I think that that's really important to remember is that when you are using a public cloud instance, you are functioning in a fail-only architecture. The expectation is that you will use this instance or you will use this configuration until such time as something starts to break down, you'll destroy it and stand it back up. Um, when you look at some of the demands that were put on KB when he was first building images, one of the things that I remember about building him building images for, for the AWS marketplace was that they constantly wanted him to uh, run the updates. And uh, the update process was uh, was an expectation. Um, the uh, um, the you know the goal was that customers would have a fast uh, fast boot time, even if they established a an updates um, uh, configuration in their in their cloud init, and. Uh, that's a little bit different than what you, you know, than the standard way of, of handling uh, enterprise Linux. You know, usually we have a, a single release and then that single release uses the updates and the updates are, are provide that back. But he pushed hard for, um, uh, he pushed hard for uh, making sure that those images were, were, you know, getting updated for reasonably uh uh, frequently. And that was a, you know, sort of a requisite of the group. And, um, and I think that that was, uh, you know, that was it's commendable for him as a, as a steward, but also it's not something that you expect to do with just a standard release of CentOS, but it is something that can be very helpful in the, in the context of uh, CentOS stream. Um, just because we're expecting it to go across multiple group, multiple uh, hardware configurations. And I'll speak a little bit more about that um, in just a second. So um, uh, there's, there's no single server architecture also uh, that is con considered to be best practice um, in the context of public administ you know, public cloud configurations. So, uh, looking to a single server to to handle uh, a you know a system and then not expecting that to be immediately replaced if something goes wrong, that's a different kind of uh, um, you know that's a different kind of expectation than you have obviously on premises. There's a lot there's a lot of different ways that you might use a single server, 
and um, that uh, that is a um, an important part of the you know part of this architecture here that I think is absolutely uh, benefits, and I'll speak about that in another slide. Uh, and the concept of golden images. Uh, um, uh, um, the golden image is the concept of the golden image is if there's something that works for you, put it all in the same, you know, the same image and continue to use that. The, the, um, the, the way that we, you know, function with those, uh, with those, um, with, with the, with the uh, configurations, it can go across multiple instance types. I might decide that today I'm not getting what I needed um, from the from the experience of using a, you know a small instance. I need a larger one, or vice versa. Um, so the way it, the system works on one should not change to the next, right? And lots of scientists want to have the same system for each one of their runs. This is the way to achieve that without putting yourself at risk or forcing your, your own hand to lose your configuration spot uh, just, by, just by nature of running an update. And a paradigm shift from on-premises is that instead of spending all of your time trying to get the latest hardware, you can, as soon as it's available, leverage it regardless of who you are. And most likely it'll be in a better, you'll be in a better position to leverage that later hardware um, because the price performance uh, will, you know, ratio will be much better than it was for um, the previous generation. So like if you were using the Haswell before and you, you know, suddenly you realize that Cascade Lake is available, you can use it if you've got the right kind of support. And what does that look like? every instance in so i'm using this aws slide obviously because i work at aws and it's easy for me to get my hands on uh this kind of uh, documentation very easily so um but when you look at the workloads uh that you have all of these instance types can be supported but you know except for the mac okay i'll just point that out all of the except for the mac instance all of these are, are instance types that can fully support uh, a CentOS stream configuration. Not all of these instance types will be profiled to handle each one of the releases for, um, uh, for, uh, 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 for CentOS, right? When you look at how these are, you know, you, lo you look at these and you look at how they're profiled and you recognize that all of that's available to you, and then you start looking across the architectural space and you see, oh, okay, well, the performance goes way up as I, you know, as I move to this more advanced architecture. And then, uh, you know, unfortunately, though, you know, the price is much higher on this instance type that I can, you know, that runs on this chipset that I can, uh, I can support. So, yeah, I can run the CentOS 7.4 on, on the Skylake, but then you know, middle of 2020, it was a C5N or a C5 refresh where uh, the C5 instance type could could support either a step down Cascade Lake or Sky Lake. Well, Cascade Lake wasn't supported on the uh, on the CentOS on CentOS 7.4 um, or RHEL 7.4, um, CentOS 1708, 7, 1708. Um, but the uh, um, but the uh, um, but the chance of hitting that hardware was there, right? So I could literally be running on a on a validated configuration with the C5, only to find myself in the position of saying, I in fact need to upgrade to a minimum of the of the next release because I need the support for the um, uh, uh, for the for the next architecture, and looking at that, you start to see exactly where these you know these complex fits 
uh, are, right? So now CentOS Stream effectively runs on all the hardware because as we get new hardware support, the CentOS Stream will be in lockstep or in fact, slightly in advance because of its ability to have QA uh, completion before uh, Red Hat releases. We will we'll see CentOS Stream support right out at the beginning of that of that architectural availability like ice lake and like you know next generation graviton so uh cloud system administration that's uh the book that i was kind of quoting there on the fail only architecture and if you haven't read it already um i highly recommend that um I would, uh, uh, it's, it really has changed my, my views on, you know, on the experience of cloud. And obviously there are lots of things, lots of people who are working on things uh, together uh, that are fantastic. Um, and I think that's all I had today for you uh, in terms of, of the, um, the original discussion, but, uh, Interested to know if anyone has any kind of questions or uh, conversation points. So I see I see the question I see the question about you know that Johnny is answering about support um, and um, and I think that there is. There is some conversion, you know, obviously that customers can do uh, to have full support from from Red Hat um, on instances, and I think that you know that that is uh, complicated at best. But one of the things that is great about fail-only architecture and the fact that we can make all these kinds of configuration management changes in in a way that is um, simple and easy to use is that we can stand up side by side the, uh, the same with a Red Hat configuration and make the changes that need to be made and verify that we can get the same, you know, we can see the same problem and even run the same workloads as long as, you know, as long as they are, and as long as the experience is, is something, you know, as long as the problem is reproducible, Customer can get, you know, a user can get the the support experience that they need, and they can run an on-demand instance for as long as they need. So I see one question in the Q and A tab. Did you see that? I, I don't see it. All right. The question for the recording is, where do you see the value from CSPs with CentOS Stream? Do you see CSPs participating in the project anytime soon? So I see a huge amount of value, right, in, in the um, in service providers, put, you know, uh, making, making a uh, making a, a contribution to the SIGs. I'd love to see, honestly, one of the places that I would love to see um, a, a large amount of per participation is around high performance computing where CentOS has had uh, a very long successful uh, uh, experience there. And, and, and I'd love to see, uh, so for example, um, uh, I think, you know, the, there is uh, initiative now for, um, for groups in, who are working with Parallel Cluster at Amazon to use uh, CentOS Stream as a foundation project uh, for their for their work, and and I see that as something that I feel like really could be brought back to the the um, the CentOS SIG community, and and uh, a contribution that could be made in terms of the HPC with with respect to the recipes and the, the configuration um, experience and just generally getting that ready for use by customers 
um, building building a, a common uh, common discussion. Um, but that's because I see it from the inside, right? I think, and you know, around other um, other groups external to um, you know the service teams, like Second Watch. You know, I'll take. I'll take them as a, a managed service provider who works on cloud, right? I think there are lots of things that they could bring in terms of the narrative and the and the processes um, for um, uh, for the you know for how they work with various public clouds and bring that back as as a way of of you know building on top of CentOS Stream. And the other place I see a whole lot of of um, of active um uh like the uh, the place that i see that we could have the most active uh community experience is around the image builder uh, os build right i really feel like and i've said this before i've said this on many occasions that i think that the os build uh project could be it would be a huge value to ensure that we have blueprints for for custom configurations of many different workloads um, that uh, that users could leverage to get um, to get an experience a consistent experience for uh, you know deep learning on a single instance or uh, configuration of various um, uh, SQL requirements for for testing or um, or a performance profile for, you know, for even for kernel testing days, right? Um, or other application testing days where that blueprint delivers an image that is common for the experience that everyone, uh, everyone intends to have. And I think that's a place where service providers really could step up their game in terms of how they commit uh, or how they, um, how they contribute to the community experience. So I don't see any other questions. And uh, so thank you so much, David, for this great presentation.